Good morning. I trust you're having a blessed week. Here it is Friday, and uh, we're looking forward to a great Sunday at Calvary. And uh, I've been gone, it seems like, much and been ill some, had a work project that affected a Sunday. And um, I told Pastor Butler that uh, I'd, I'd cover Sunday if uh, so you'll have to put up with me, I guess. Uh, across the board. Bring somebody with you Sunday, 9.30. We join for prayer, 10 o'clock. This currently is at 2635 West Nichols in Springfield, and uh, you will be blessed. Last Sunday, a uh, precious lady received the Holy Ghost. Saints of God were just laid out, praying, seeking God, recognizing that they do have a daysma, that there is one who will reach between heaven and earth, and it is the mediator between God and man. It is the man Christ Jesus. It was a great service. If you didn't get to be there, please go online and look at it. We'd love for you to be part of Calvary in any means that you could possibly be. Right now, we're in Acts chapter 2, and this deserves for you to share it. It deserves for you to post. It deserves for you to comment. It deserves for you to ask questions. Some of what we're going to talk about today, having to do with the Holy Ghost, I have taught extensively about earlier in this series on the book of Acts, and even before that, when I did the What the Bible Says uh, portion back in uh, February, early March, somewhere along there. So I'm not going to spend as much time talking about the Holy Ghost. Instead, we'll refer you to some other material, or if you have a question, uh, feel free to ask, or I have a lesson that I have taught in various settings that uh, I could make available to you as well. All of that portion of what we deal with is in uh, my What the Bible Says Home Bible Study, which is seven topical lessons, and um, I didn't intend to get into selling, but uh, it is available right now at the pre-release price. It was released three years ago, and before it was released, it was selling, sold for $21.99, I believe. And then since then, it's been $36.99 or so. Right now, it's $21.99. It gives you a lifetime opportunity to duplicate all of the lesson material that is uh, in the book. Lesson material as far as handouts to students. Uh, enough of commercial on, on church time. So, it's good to be with you. Share, like. Hey, and one thing, tomorrow for Calvary, we will be having a work day at uh, the new property on North Park and uh, bring work clothes. Um, if you have saws, whatever, we're cutting stuff down right now. That's about what it amounts to. And uh, doing some cleanup of landscaping and trying to get uh, as much outside done as we can. Very grateful for the Fountain of Life, current owners who are allowing us this privilege uh, even before we have concluded the uh, situation in a couple of weeks from now. All right, Acts chapter 2. Peter has preached. Oh, if I could preach like Peter and have the kind of response that Simon Peter had. 3,000 are going to receive his word and they will repent, they will be baptized and receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost. What has he preached? Well, he has preached the gospel, simple, unadorned, taking them back to Psalm 16 and to Psalm 110, preaching about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, pointing out to them that they are the ones who have crucified their Messiah, the one who they anticipated giving them great deliverance and great victory in establishing the nation of Israel. They stand indicted. Some of the audience look to Peter, to James, John, Matthew, Bartholomew, uh, Jude, uh, all of the rest look to them and say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter uh, commences to answer their question. He says, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. As we talked about yesterday, repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ are part and parcel 
of the process of having our sins washed completely from our life. Repentance alone will not do it. Baptism alone will not accomplish it. In order for sin of the past to be fully addressed, we need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If you have not been baptized, we'd love to extend that opportunity to you and uh, we'd love to have about 50 baptized Sunday at Calvary's temporary location. And so if you're thinking about that, if you will just send a note, if you'll let us know, we'll be glad to arrange and make plans for all of that. Today we're going to talk about the next part of this, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Tag this to somebody, share it, ask a question, comment, do something that would raise the awareness of what is happening here. If you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, either at Calvary or at my personal YouTube channel, I encourage you to do that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. A number of different terms are used in the New Testament to describe this which is being promised to the multitude. And I want you to think about these phrases, and this is not all of them because I'm not going to talk about the comforter, but I'm only going to reference where there is something that talks about the spirit of. But what I'd like for you to think about as we're doing this is how each of these things are relevant and impacting in our life. Well, in John chapter 14 and 17, in Jesus' rather extensive discourse where he talks most about the Holy Ghost of any time, in all of his dealings with the apostles, he calls, it, he calls the Holy Ghost the Spirit of Truth. Spirit of Truth. Truth filters untruth. Untruths cannot stand alongside truth and match up. In teaching people how to know a counterfeit bill, for years the Treasury Department spent far more time teaching their agents about what the real deal looked like rather than informing them regarding the counterfeit. Because if you know the truth, then you recognize untruth rather handily unless you have allowed yourself to come into a spiritual situation where you choose, as Pharaoh did in the Old Testament, where you choose to believe a lie and your heart becomes hardened against the truth. Spirit of truth. We need to filter and we have to have the Holy Ghost for this to happen. It is the spirit of truth. It is the comforter. It comes alongside to help in whatever dilemma of our life there is. John 14, 26. In 2 Corinthians 4, 13, it speaks of the spirit of faith. The Holy Ghost inside of you will cause you to have a confidence in God and in God's word. In Hebrews 10 and 29, it speaks of the spirit of grace and the gift of the Holy Ghost is us receiving the grandness of the grace of God, but it should create in us a spirit of grace in our dealing with others. 
In Romans 1, 4, there is the spirit of holiness, the spirit that sets apart. That's where the word holy or holiness refers to. Set apart. God's people are set apart from the world. God is set apart. Jesus set apart from all other deities. Set apart. The Holy Ghost sets apart God's people. I was looking at a video of a sermon I preached years ago at, at uh, Truth Tabernacle. And uh, I wasn't watching the video. It's actually on VHS. And uh, the title of the message is That Which is Sanctified to God Will Be Sanctified by God. The word sanctified, again, is the same as what's translated elsewhere as holy. And so Israel sanctified all of these various materials for the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. It was an extraordinary building. If you looked at it from the outside, there wasn't much to it, seemingly. But inside, it was there, there were... There was gold and brass and silver and so so many bit different things. It was it was remarkable. So they had sanctified these things to God. But then the scripture says there came the day that they dedicated that tabernacle to the Lord, and he sanctified it, he set it apart by his glory. In a similar way, when you have the Holy Ghost. There is a spirit of set-apartness that is in your life. Ephesians 1, 17 talks about the spirit of wisdom. And I know that this is not the Webster way of defining wisdom, but I like it. It's wisdom is knowing what to do next. The spirit of truth will guide you. It will show you the course of action. It is a spirit of power, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 7. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. People who live church-going lives without the power of the Holy Ghost are missing the ingredient that is essential to do something more than have social impact in the society that we're part of. It's the spirit of love in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Holy Ghost can help you love people that you didn't love before. It's the spirit of life in Romans 8 and 32. You were dead in your trespass and in your sin, but the Holy Ghost is the spirit of resurrection, the same spirit that brought Christ out of the grave. That's the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In 1 Peter 4, 14, he called it the spirit of glory. Aren't you glad that you can have the Holy Ghost? Aren't you glad that the Holy Ghost is promised to you? Think about all of the different responses. Think about all of the different reactions that those phrases bring home to our life. All of it is connected with the spirit. We talk about the gifts of the spirit in Corinthians. And we talk about the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. All of it having to do with the Holy Ghost. All of it finding its origin in the Holy Ghost. Ye baptized in his name, repented, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, let's isolate that a little bit. Gift. Gift. Think about the package wrapped. Don't know what's inside. Or perhaps we do know. Gift. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So this is undeserved. It's part of God's grace. 
I said, Preacher, I, I can't be part of any of that. I don't deserve it. Well, welcome to the club. That fits all of us. This is the gift of God. The Holy Ghost is a gift. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That word shall indicates assurance. And repeatedly in the scripture, God's promises have a shall associated with them. This same Jesus, whom you've seen go, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go. Go through the Bible. Elder James Lumpkin, who is now deceased, had a sermon he would preach about the shall of the Bible shall. And I mean it builds incredible faith when you get to affirming the promises of God, ye shall, ye shall, ye shall. And that's what we have here. It isn't that if you repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, there is the possibility that you would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Meet the qualifications and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that a beautiful affirmation? Isn't that a beautiful promise? Repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ are essential behaviors for me. But having met those qualifications, and as I noted earlier, sometimes God fills someone with the Holy Ghost before they have been baptized, but he is taking them at the sense of expectation of their being baptized in the future. Having met those qualifications, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Some people receive it the very day that they're baptized. Many receive it in the baptistry. Some have the experience that the people in the upper room at Pentecost did, where they tarry for days, they spend time seeking God, praying. Perhaps they have to work out repentance. Perhaps they have to learn how to yield and to open because the word receive means that this is a gift that is available, but you must possess it. You must claim it. You must uh, accept it as yours. And so there are people for, for whatever reason, it takes some time for them to get there. And I'm not going to indict that because Jesus closest followers spent time in a prayer meeting before they were filled with the Holy Ghost. You shall, but whether it's the day you're baptized, a week later, a month later, two months later, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I want to point something out here. In 1 Corinthians, we come back around to the operation of gifts. And really, it's not coming back around to the operation of gifts. Instead, it is the first occasion when the operation of the gifts of the Spirit is addressed. And the reason it's addressed is because the Corinthian church was handling it and using the gifts of the Spirit inappropriately. The word that is translated gift in 1 Corinthians 14 is a different word than is what's translated gift here. The gift there has the intent of broad edification. It is for the building up of the entirety of the body of Christ. The gift of the Holy Ghost that is spoken of in Acts chapter 2 is an individual personal encounter and experience that you have. God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 
Paul is giving direction on how to handle things like tongues and interpretation. Tongues are the word of prophecy and the word of wisdom, knowledge, and all of the rest. What happens here on the day of Pentecost needed no instruction. Instead, it was a divine interruption. Ye shall receive. Ye shall receive. And that promise is to you. We're going to get into that next week. But that promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you look up all of the things that the Holy Ghost will bring to your life, he is a teacher, it's a comforter, it's a power to witness, it's personal direction, it's so much more. Now, I want to take a minute here because sometimes we get sometimes we get things isolated and we assume the understanding of that which preceded but to understand to but to assume an understanding of that which is preceded is often a mistake so what what I want to do is think about what has brought this audience to the place where Peter is saying to them, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. What has brought them to the place where this is being talked about and can now be experienced by them? And what I want to do is I'm going to move from Peter saying this backward. And then when we get to the start, I'm going to move from the start back to this point. Okay, so let's let's just just see if we can track here, and it can expand perhaps our perception of how salvation comes. So Peter has said to them, "Do X Y Z, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost." The X Y Z is that they are to do an about face, repent regarding their sin, regarding their crucifixion of Jesus Christ and they were to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and in so doing their past sin including crucifying Jesus was washed clean from their life and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost what precedes repentance and baptism in Jesus name they were convicted of their sinfulness regarding crucifying the one who was both Lord and Christ. What precedes their conviction? Conviction came because after hearing Peter preach as to who Jesus was and about the death, burial, and resurrection and this being a fulfillment of prophecy, they had faith that this Jesus was both sovereign authority and the anointed one, that he was both Lord and Christ. What's happened before they have this faith? Peter has preached the gospel of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't isolate Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38, and turn it into a doctrine that leaves out Calvary and leaves out the resurrection and leaves out the preaching of the gospel that leaves out faith and conviction. All of these things are part and parcel of the process of someone being brought to the place where they can truly receive the answer to the question, what shall we do? And the answer include, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's look at it going back the other direction. Multitudes come together. 
to that multitude, Peter used the Old Testament as the authority to declare the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Pattern over and over, we see in the book of Acts, preach the word of God. Let the word of God be the authority. Okay, so death, burial, and resurrection, he has preached it. He speaks of their sin regarding Jesus' crucifixion. Okay, thirdly, he identifies this Jesus who they crucified as both Lord and Christ. Fourth, his preaching produces faith. And so some of this multitude believe Peter's message. And their faith, their belief in what Peter had said to them and as to who this Jesus was and as to what the Messiah was to bring and the authority of the place of the Lord, that sovereign authority, that none beyond him authority, caused them to ask, what shall we do? They were told to do, to take action, to do an about face from their past life, repent, and to head a new direction in their future life, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and in so doing, their sin, including the sin of crucifying the one who was both Lord and Christ, would be washed from their life. And then ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Again, point being, don't isolate. Instead, include. Include. Isolation leads to misunderstanding. But when you put the scripture within its context and you preach the full counsel of God, people will respond. It is often a slower process than reaching for the heartstrings of emotion, but it is a process that has a lasting impact. How important is all of this? Go read Romans 8 and 9. Paul said, without the Spirit, we're none of his. Let that just sink in. The Holy Ghost is a gift and grace to receive the Holy Ghost is also a gift. You can have the Holy Ghost. Preacher, what do I need to do? Well, do you have faith that Jesus is the Messiah? That he is the Christ, that he is the anointed one? That he will address your sin and establish the kingdom of God in your life? whether your neighbor ever has it or not, the kingdom of God in your life, do you believe that? If you believe that, ask the question, what shall I do? I, I do believe it. What, what do I do now? And I think Peter's answer is just perfect. While you're driving just now, you can repent. We can meet you this afternoon or tomorrow and baptize you in Jesus' name. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I wonder who's going to receive the Holy Ghost at Calvary this Sunday. Don't you? I, I, I'm just, I have this expectation. A prophetic word came to us a while back about the opening of something expansive. Why? Because this is a church that has been in prayer thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours have been prayed over the last six years. Satan, your strongholds are coming down. In the name of Jesus, they're coming down. To God be the glory for the things that He's done. 
If you'd like to have a home Bible study, we have teachers that are available and ready. I'd love to spend some time with you in the Word of God. 9.30, we will be in prayer Sunday. And at 10 o'clock, we will be having church. 2635 West Nichols. We're in the gymnasium of the Free Will Baptist Church there. And we'll make room for you. We'll make room for you. And we're only a few weeks away from being in our own quarters. And we're looking forward to that. And uh, want to see you there as well, of course. Let me pray with and for you today. God, let this word fall on good ground. You know who needs to receive it. You know who, oh God, is looking for direction in their life. And I'm not real interested in just preaching to people who can nod their head in affirmation and give an amen. But I'm interested in the seeking, the searching, the hungry. Those, oh God, that are so desperately lost. And God, you know how to connect us to them. There's... A jailer somewhere who needs salvation. There's an Ethiopian traveling through a wilderness, disappointed in his experience in worship. Oh, God. Lead us to the hungry. Break open the barricades of sin. Let revival happen as you have said it would in our city. Let the supernatural unfold. The gifts of the Spirit occur. I pray it all in the saving name of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and all of God's people. Say amen. 8.30 tomorrow, work day at Calvary. We'd love to see you there, even if you've never visited our church as of yet. It's kind of like the woman at the well of Samaria. We need help. We need help. Jesus said, can you give me some water to drink? Well, do you have a commercial wood chipper? We'll put it to work. If you're a commercial painter in a few weeks, you can join our great painter. If you're a finished carpenter, if you can do almost anything, we've got some work and could put you to work as we get classrooms ready and an auditorium updated and uh, sound equipment moved in and everything else. I am excited about God's work. See you Sunday. See you next week if you're part of Calvary Online. Sow that seed, springfieldcalvary.church, right-hand corner, opportunity to give. God bless.